It's uh, it's great to be here, everybody. Thanks for uh, hanging in there. I had a little bit of technical glitch trying to figure some things out. Uh, no matter what year it is, 2020, I thought we were supposed to be like in Blade Runner by now, but you know, I'm still figuring out Zoom. So yeah, my email journey uh, starts with becoming a designer about 15 years ago and getting into product and figuring out like, oh, I love how product works. And then, oh, who's taking care of the emails? Oh, crap. It turns out people love like getting our emails on the interactions on this product. How, who's doing that? Wait, we farmed that out to like somebody else who doesn't care. No, no, no. Let's take that back into product. And so that's how things started for me is I started caring about what customers were getting and uh, email became more and more of an important thing to me. I had no uh, idea that I would uh, end up really loving this entire sort of industry. And then uh, as Veronica and I were talking about before, we just have the best community in the email geek space. And it reminds me a lot of the early days of the web. And I think Veronica said as much as well. So I'm just excited to be here. I uh, started really good emails in 2014 and I am just championing relationships and good user experience in email design and dev and all that stuff. So I just can't believe I get to do this every day. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. No, we're so excited to have you. I love that story. Um, my story is I'm director of product at Dispatch now, but my background is in consumer products. And I wasn't strictly in email before that. I always worked for services that depended on email, obviously, to, to communicate with, with users. But I have a background in online dating, music streaming. And mm -hmm. I found my way to Dispatch because I really believed in what they're doing, which is like trying to make emails really easy for teams without having to compromise on like the interactivity or the quality of emails. And um, what I didn't realize getting into it is that it reminds me a lot of like, the services where I worked, you know, a long time ago, where we launched the first Android or iOS apps, um, you know, like tech 10, 10 plus years ago, I guess, that email is still a really small group of people who are still talking to each other, very much a community, like, like you said, and a network. And that makes it kind of like a great place to be. Mm -hmm. So let me set the stage for today. Um, we're going to talk about conversions in AMP and like the opportunity in AMP. This isn't a how do you code AMP emails? I think neither Matthew or, or me really are experts in like the technical implementation side of things, but we have experts at Dispatch who can definitely answer those questions if you have them. Um, what we're going to talk about is the opportunity, how you should be experimenting, and we're, we're going to do a couple case studies. So I think you're here for a really interesting conversation. Um, so briefly, AMP basically brings uh, new possibilities to email that we haven't seen in probably decades. Um, without having to click through to a web page, you can do things like submit a form, reply to a comment, uh, and see live data that's decided when the recipient opens the email instead of when you send it to them, which I think is really mm -hmm. exciting. So uh, here's what we have for you today. Quickly, what we'll cover, uh, we're gonna just start with the pros and cons of AMP because I think there's some really good conversation to be had there. Uh, we'll do a few examples of AMP and the ROI that we've seen. We're gonna briefly touch on fallbacks and how to make sure that those cover a lot of cases. And then, um, just cover a few future possibilities as well. And then we'll do some Q&A discussion at the end with the, with the audience, of course. So let's get into the, the pros and cons. Um, we've been listening to folks in the industry who've been talking about AMP since it was announced, AMP for emails since it was announced a couple of years ago. Um, and a few of you actually approached us on Twitter and approached Matthew on Twitter with some thoughts. And so I guess I'll start with this. Like Matthew, what do you think is your main concern what are the main cons that you have in mind with AMP? And then we'll talk about the pros in a second. Awesome. Yeah, I think the, the things that stick out for me are, you know, I, I get really excited about um, the forward movement of technology with email and moving toward the dynamic web that we know, right? And email has, has lagged behind for a lot of reasons. And AMP is pushing that forward, but there are challenges specifically with AMP, not with the technology and the direction, but for one, it's proprietary, right? So Google is sitting here saying this is ours and it makes sense. Like they, they've uh, created this technology in many ways as a way to be able to interact with, you know, Gmail and Google Docs and other things. And it's powerful and it's crazy. And then they make it available for other people. Um, but it's a closed system. And when you have closed systems, you just have natural privacy issues. You have, you know, um, the possibility of like building your 
your own technology stack on theirs and then there's changes or gets removed or something like that. And so it's a, it's an unstable system uh, where open source technologies are a lot, a uh, lot more powerful and uh, malleable and sustainable. So um, you know, then there's limited client support currently. It's one of those things where if there's not as much adoption yet, and so that can be a challenge, but it's overcomable. Um, and then, you know, we have the, it's restricted to recipients and then the accessibility challenges, you know, are you providing an email that is um, second class to people who can't access uh, AMP emails? Like we've got to address that. And then worst and hardest, I think, is that like there's this approval process on some of these things. And it's, you know, I think you're more dialed in on some of that than I am. But as I learned more about it from you, I thought, you know, these are the kinds of things that stifle creativity. So why don't you take a uh, stab at some of these pros and we'll dig in over the rest of the webinar as well. Yeah, definitely. Um the approval process, I think, I think there's room definitely for Google to improve there, especially making some of it like more accessible, better documentation. I know that's coming, that they're working on it. Um, on the pro side, I mean, the reason we're having the conversation about AMP and that dispatch as a business is we're, we're really hedging on this. We're really excited about it is that it's how I'm, what I mentioned earlier, so many new possibilities. So the live and up-to-date portion of it is the part that excites me the most, because I think there's so much potential there, both on the transactional side where you're communicating with users about things that they want to hear about. And then on the marketing side where you're like, you know, exciting your recipients about what you're doing and trying to, as, as I think we'll talk about a little bit more, but like building a relationship with the brand. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead of showing expired information, you're showing live information that gets decided when the email's sent. I think you can do more with personalization in this context too. Like, you know, we talk a little bit about what, like what algorithm decided to show me this information here, you're going to see things that are really personalized to you. Um, there are probably endless use cases. I like the word endless because we haven't come up with all of them yet. The list is right. endless. Um, it does simplify, co simplify coding because um, you're pulling information from a data source instead of jamming everything into the email with the moment when you send it. Um, definitely reduces friction points. Like instead of having to launch a browser, re-log into a service to complete a form to like, you know, add something mm. to your cart, you can do that right in the email. And um, while it's new, we have tons of proof points that we're going to show that actually tell you that it's kind of like a proven ROI. So there's some up, uh, upfront investment for sure, but I do think that the, that some of those things are proven. Um, I think what we're going to talk about today is like whether you should invest in doing this. I think that's like the biggest question here. All right, let's go into some of... Uh, some examples of these interactive emails and the ROI. So I wanted to give a shout out to the Unspam conference that RGE actually just did recently. There's a talk there um, by a couple of email geeks, April Mullen and Jen Capstra on AMP that we'll try to like link it somewhere here when we send out the summary of the webinar, but they covered a lot of use cases and we're not going to, you know, recover what they did, but I definitely recommend that talk. Um, instead, we're going to talk about um, ROI specifically. And before I get into that, the question for Matthew is, do you remember the first example of an AMP email that you saw? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm going to sort of put myself in a category here, but I am, I'm hardcore Pinterest guy. <laughs> you know, like there's a bunch of jokes about guys like us, but um you know, I, I love Pinterest. I use it all day long for, you know, creative stuff. I love to interior design. And so there's a ton of information there. So I, and uh, really good emails back in the day, we did a, a really long exhaustive sort of deep dive into, you know, the intelligence of Pinterest emails. So I've been a fan for a long time and a guy named uh, Seth Weisfeld has spoken a lot in the email geeks community and at different, you know, conferences about some of the things that they've done. So I'm paying attention, you know, and, um, yeah, getting that first, uh, opportunity to actually pin within the email and navigate around, boof, <laughs> like yeah. mind blown, excited. Uh, you know, it's, it feels like, you know, okay, where's Gandalf? Like who, who, who threw some magic on this shit? This is crazy. I got excited and I knew that like, for me, this is, this is the future. This is where we break down, you know, barriers 
that have kept us from experiencing like a dynamic web in our inbox. So yeah. that was my first. How about you? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm definitely this one. It's, mm. uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time living in Google Docs as like a, a product geek, I guess. And when I started being able to like reply to a comment directly in here, the first time I was like, oh, like, of course, of course I want this. Um, <laughs> When you first saw the the Google Docs reply, did you actually know that this was AMP the first time you experienced it? You know, for me, I thought, oh, this is just a Gmail thing. You know what I mean? Like it all yeah. felt so seamless and integrated that it, it didn't even occur to me that that was what was going on. But of course it is, you know? Yeah, I think that's like the, the thing about AMP to keep in mind when you mentioned that it's a proprietary technology. Like Google obviously rolled this out on their own and kept it into like just the Gmail side of things for a long time. And the first couple of times I saw it, I just, again, same as you assumed it was like, oh, finally Gmail's doing things that I want instead of just giving me a bunch of tabs. <laughs> but then I realized that it was AMP and then like a light bulb went off, like, oh, like this is gonna be good. Like there's more coming from this. Mm -hmm. um, this is the quintessential AMP example that I share with people when they're like, what's AMP? Or like, I've heard of this, but what is it really? Because everybody's had a chance to actually experience it and play with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's testament to like Google trying things out before they roll it out. But what we'll see is that this is actually going to be available to everybody who wants to use it. You know, they're replying to comments. And in Dispatch, this is one of the first things that we're going to bring is letting people reply to like their own comments on our platform as well. And I know it's going to be spread out really across the email industry pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, our second example is also a Google one, but I love this one. Um, I think Google's been experimenting and like pushing the e-commerce context with AMP. And the Nest example is like, you can actually add this item to your cart, which to me, they've just like basically cut out half the funnel. Instead of having you look at a bunch of items, go to the browser, look at the items, add them to your cart in the browser, and then try to convert you there. And then like, follow you around with a bunch of retargeting until you actually check out. Here they've just like preempted that. You can just add the item directly to your cart in the email. And so my question for you is, do you think they're building up to like taking the whole checkout experience and putting that directly in the email? Like, is that what's coming next in emails? Uh, let me get my crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hope so, right? Um, whether it's AMP uh, alone, uh, and, and Google has been involved in open source technologies before. So maybe at some point, you know, uh, AMP gets built out into something that, that could be, you know, open sourced. But, um, you know, it only makes sense, right? So for, for Google to move to a point where they've got Google Checkout and then they just seamlessly integrate this, you know, into their platform, you know, it just removes more friction. So I had an interesting conversation um, with somebody on email gigs the other day where they just weren't buying it. They were saying like, this just doesn't make sense. Like this amount of friction that you're talking about is so minuscule. What are you talking about? And I brought up the example of Loom. Loom is a, a video sharing uh, tool, uh, feedback using video sharing tool uh, that uh, Veronica and I have talked about a little bit, but it, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I'm sort of sold out on it. And one of the things I think is incredible about it is QuickTime has always been there on your Mac and you can share, you know, you can like get the file, put it on Dropbox, uh, put that link into Slack, no problem. Like nothing new with the technology. What, what's the problem here? Like it's so little friction. It's easy. But once you try Loom and you record a video and it's uploading while you, you know, um, and saving while you continue recording. And then by the time you're done recording, it just saves the last few seconds and boom, you've got a link. You can edit it. You can annotate it. You can comment on it right in a little, you know, space like that's magic. And that lack of friction is what's possible here. So not only to be able to add to your cart, then check out, but also to have that entire experience fluidly ready and available. That's where we're going, right? The inbox becomes like a, a logged in state of the web. And that's when everything changes, where email is no longer an archive type file that has just been sent to you and you only, but it is an interactive state and you can have a logged in state. You can have a logged out state. You can have privacy protection. You can have all that you expect on the web, but it's right there in your inbox. That's next level. I'm excited.
Yeah, I love what you're saying about it no longer being this like static artifact that's sent. I mean, there's there's beauty in that too. Um, but it, I think it's really easy to rely on saying something like, well, this is great for marketers. Like it's good for business results. You know, this is like growth right. work. And it definitely is, that's true. But that's obscuring the fact that it's hugely valuable to the end user or the end customer, the person who signed up for this email. Like you're getting this email because you obviously signed up. You care about Nest, right? And so why not make it easy if they do have intent to purchase? I think it's good for both sides. Definitely agree with that. Okay, next example is an example I love. Um, we can't tell you who it is. It's uh, because it's their pre-launch. It's a dispatch customer. They're a well-known player in the industry and they asked for our help to take uh, their transactional emails and amplify them. That's the first of many amp puns <laughs> for the audience. I hope you're ready for it. Um, uh, they're testing them out at scale, but on the transactional side. And um, I think a lot of the examples we see with AMP are, they tend to be like marketing examples, like the Nest example. But transactional actually has a huge amount of opportunity here. So this one is still like replying to comments. Um, Google Docs, they saw 500% increase in responses to comments once they started using the AMP emails, which I mean, like, that's a huge number. You never see that really with some of the changes that we see. It just, that shows you that it's redefining how email works. But the question I have is, what do you think we'll see more of uh, in terms of use cases? Do you think like transactional is where AMP's going to live? Is it marketing? Is it going to straddle both? Like who should be leveraging AMP at this point? Which mm -hmm. use case? Um, so this is where I have kind of an opinion about marketing versus you know, product or marketing versus transactional. I don't see them. Um, I don't look at my relationship with my girlfriend who, you know, so if COVID ever ends, maybe we, we would love to get married and do that kind of thing. So I'm in this relationship with this woman that has a story that starts in San Francisco where we meet and connect and it continues now. And there are parts of our relationship that are, transactional now, Hey, you know, what are we going to cook for the kids tonight? Um, but, and the beginning has its own story. Like, can I take you out for a date, you know, for salt and straw ice cream? And, but that's, I don't make a distinction. I don't like say, Oh, that's marketing. And this is transactional. It's all part of the relational dynamic. It's all part of the funnel. Right. And so the way I think about this is marketing is just the beginning of the funnel. And Transactional is this relational dynamic uh, further down the funnel. And so the way that you use AMP is going to be different, but equally powerful in each. The opportunity is that the further into the relationship with the customer or the client, if you're in B2B, the way that you're connected there, you potentially have more information. So you get to be more personalized. You might have more data to to help serve them with in the beginning of the relationship, you can use AMP to ask more questions the way that, um, you know, in the beginning of any relationship, you're in a discovery uh, mode. And so you use AMP to do those kinds of things. Later on, you're in a, uh, a little bit more like mirroring mode. I think I heard you say this, is this still important to you? Is this the information that you want? So you can see this relational dynamic that's really important to me that when we get out of a marketing speak and we start relating to our customers, the way we already know how to relate to each other, we just change the dynamic to be a little bit more um, in, in line with our brand and voice and tone and stuff, get, everything changes. And AMP makes that a lot more vital and, and uh, gives it potency in a way that static doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I think that's the way to approach this is not, you know, we're speaking to somebody, but we're working with or we're helping people. Mm -hmm. um, we have this stat here. We did a survey where we talked to thousands of people, like regular people, not email geeks, like people to whom we send emails, people who live their life and like don't want to receive too many emails, even though they told us they still do. Um, <laughs> we asked these people whether they like interactive emails, whether they're getting interactive emails, whether they get too many emails. And they told us a few things. One, as I said, they're getting too many emails still. Um, but 50% of people told us that they like it when they see interactive content in an email and that um, that they're actually seeing this in email, but they're not seeing many of them, which I think tells us that there's an opportunity to do more of it. Um, reflecting on what you've been saying about like relationships instead of 
transactions with customers. What do you see as like the direction in the industry with regards to email communication? Is it is it those relationships? Is it using, you know, interactivity or AMP to actually make that happen? What do you see in your like golden age of email crystal ball? <laughs> yeah, I love that term, golden age of email. That's I'm going to keep heading. that. It's such a good... <laughs> By the way, Matthew coined this. I didn't come up with it on the fly. Uh, it's but, all um... good. It's all good. I love it. It's, yeah. you know, to me, we, we aren't there yet. You know, people keep saying email is dead. Like you hear it. And, and I'm just like, you, you jokers have no idea what kind of potential we're sitting in, right? Where, you know, you and I have talked about this reality that with email, you're in this invited state. So somebody has said, I'd like to hear more from you. You know, that's a, that's a relational dynamic, right? Uh, whereas advertising is, is I unwanted. I have to deal with it because I'm on a site or I'm getting retargeted or whatever, that's a different dynamic. But with, you know, email, I said, yes, please. I'd like to be in relationship with you. And then I have to, as the uh, company or uh, product or email, or sorry, e-commerce company, I need to, um, you know, validate and encourage and get and prove myself. I have to create trustworthiness. You know, as we do more and more of that, we get, you know, more uh, effective and email grows and it, and it really does enter a golden age. I think that the golden age of email uh, will be precipitated by the legacy clients that are uh, maintaining still some um, foothold for older clients like Outlook, uh, that when that domino falls, then we'll begin seeing a level of technology that uh, we are seeing already on the web that is dynamic content that is really personalized. We're getting uh, not just more um, more effective in personalization, but I think we're seeing tools come that are allowing people to get to uh, serve customers more personally, much more easily. So it's not as complex and difficult to manage some of that personalization. And then getting dynamic content is, is everything, right? Like being able to not just um, have an email that I got because it was segmented appropriately for me. I often use the, uh, my friend Jorge was working at uh, uh, Reverb. They used uh, uh, musical instruments, you know, site. And for a while they would just send out an email with like, guitars and drums and flutes and, you know, everything else in one, one email and you would browse it the way you would a, a big brochure, right? No personalization in a printed brochure. Um, then they began to segment people based on their actions on the site. Were you looking more at drums or more at guitars? Oh, you're a drummer. So we're going to give you more drums. So we're going to emphasize that more and de-emphasize the rest. And that's really powerful, you know, segmentation and personalization. AMP takes that a step further and says, you know, one, would you like to see more drums, more guitars, or more flutes? You can ask right there in the email, more drums, please. And then you provide that content. You don't have to wait for the next email. You don't have to be loaded into the next site. You just show drums right there. Great. We have, you know, four sales on drums. Are you more interested in this category of drums or this category of drums? Or do you want to see these, you know, top sales? Boom, boom, boom. And you're taking people on that customer journey and developing that customer journey, tightening that customer journey. And as you do that, if you do your job well, you're solving problems for customers they become loyal, they spend money, this drives commerce. So this is, this is where things get fun. Yeah. So we're just on the cusp of it. Right. Um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to get into a couple of examples that I think will like really underscore the point you've just made here. Uh, the first is Pinterest, which is your favorite. There've been a few iterations of Pinterest emails that use AMP. I think we've seen the one where you can uh, pin directly within the email. There are, um, there are a bunch of notifications, like the ones I'm getting right now, are it, that the content that they serve to me is AMP. So instead of deciding what they're going to put in an email, 
to me a few days ago or like at some point it's live. And I, I think what's happening there is that if I use Pinterest and I start looking at, you know, um, cool houses in Santa Fe, they'll show me that in the email today instead of like, you know, nail polish colors, which would have been what I was looking at like a few days ago. Um, one of the things I think about a lot is that I have yet to see the email with the actions where I can pin directly in the email. I think it was just a really small A-B test and not a lot of people saw that. Um, it seems that from their test results that I heard at like Litmus Live last year, that 20%, um, the 20 percent more people are actually pinning in an email if they're given the option, mm. but it hasn't been rolled out to everybody. I had this theory that it's, uh, you know, I don't work at Pinterest, but I had this theory that it might have been because their daily active users or monthly active user numbers might have been tanking because people are using Pinterest in an email instead of like logging into the app or the platform. And then you go to your weekly business meeting and everybody freaks out because the numbers are going down until some PMs like, oh, it's because we're using AMP. It's awesome. People are pinning way more, but they're logging in less. Um, right. Do you think changing where the activity takes place, like moving it to email as another platform is something that we're going to see happen? And do you think it matters that you're just like taking an audience and moving them from one place to the other? And I guess like the call to action here is that let's measure engagement, not just in terms of like, you know, these vanity metrics, like daily active users maybe. Right. Um, but what do you think the impact is to, to kind of like measuring ROI on emails if people are doing things in different places than they have been traditionally? Well, along with the use of AMP, you know, we're, we need to see more and more effective uh, event tracking tools, you know, for email so that we can really see what people are doing uh, and have the same level of analytic that we have in, in web, you know, uh, in email. And so, you know, at some point, um, people need to remember that email is a unique uh, environment, right? It is not the same as the browser, nor is it the same as, you know, a, a mobile experience alone. So mobile browsing, desktop browsing, two separate things, um, desktop email, mobile email, two separate things, you, similar, but, you know, unique to each other. And uh, oftentimes email is a utility experience, or at least it's currently that way and it's it's viewed that way and i think people like to move through emails in a task oriented environment so there is a an urgency or a presentness a moment by moment interaction that's appropriate for email whereas the web has a, a longer time frame like it it might be uh, less prescient in terms of that moment so people will probably start to deliver you know AMP oriented emails, dynamic content, but with that time frame that's shorter. Um, and the question there would be if people are pinning, you know, in an email, are they lacking that discovery? So how do you use AMP emails to show a little bit of the web and enough to like tease and get people to feel like they're engaging and then take them to the web for that bigger, fuller experience, right? I think, or an app. Mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, in Pinterest case. So there's a lot of ways to do this. It, it's just that we need to start thinking about these environments as different places that people, you know, want to interact and you need to respect the characteristics of each environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been talking internally about this from the perspective of like, it's taking apps in email and making that the possibility. And I love that. It's uh, Matt, Her Matt Harris, our CEO has been talking about that. And imagine if you could like just have little apps for doing things in an email and then you consider mm -hmm. those the, the, you know, the next platform where you're trying to drive engagement and build a relationship. I think that's, that's really going to scale in terms of, of bringing that to, to your portfolio of other services. Okay, here's a cool example of um, a carousel taking carousel and uh, list to a what I think is like it's a logical conclusion in AMP. I love this because it's solving a real problem we've experienced. So like booking sends me this email and booking a trip. I see my favorite hotel is available and I click through and like it's sold out. Um, because when the email was sent, there were rooms available. And uh, by the time I got around to like opening the email and booking my trip on the Saturday, because nobody has time to do this and booking sends you like three emails a day. Um, I don't know how they keep up with that volume of emails. They're amazing. <laughs> But uh, so this is really solving a problem, which is like only show me stuff that's available in the moment where I'm like in the mood for looking and booking a trip. Um, I think this applies to like 
related items, sale items, you know, available spots in like a yoga or spin class. I think about that a lot, like those sell out all the time. Do you think that this dynamic component is more likely to result in conversions if it's hooked up to like the live data source as opposed to sending the stale thing? Like, and are people going to even notice? How do you get around people knowing that you're only showing them like the real thing? Right. Well, so I think there's two, two answers to that for me. And, and you know, like I'm taking a my best guess, right? Like I get excited about these things, but uh, who knows? Um, I think in terms of engagement, I think when you reduce friction to people being able to take action, you, uh, you see a win. Now that said, there are different personalities and personas that uh, are going to be browsing booking.com for instance, in different ways. They'll have like the discovery shopper, right? The person who's thinking more about like the big vacations they want to take in their life versus the person's like, I'm going to Japan this winter, go, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, or I have a business trip and I need to figure out where I'm going to be staying or something like that. So depending on the person's intent and their focus, um, you know, you're, you need to deliver people unique information, unique content to help them achieve that goal. Um, and I think adapting your AMP, you know, emails to be able to do that. Uh, is a, is an important thing. And I think later in the webinar, we'll address like, uh, do you have to go as big as booking.com has gone here or as Pinterest has gone? Like there's a lot of ways to solve these kinds of things, right? So um, the other thing that comes up for me is do people even know, right? Which you asked. But what I would do is go ahead and break the fourth wall and say, hey, we're experimenting with something wildly new in email. This email acts more like a web page. Go ahead and, and take an action here, little neat arrow, and you know, see what happens. And you'll you can book right here in the email or those kinds of things. That's when things get really exciting and powerful, is that kind of you know dynamic interaction that allows for people to take, you know, those types of tools and and see something happen. So you know, that's, um, I think there are a lot of ways that we can just sort of be a little bit more relational and honest with our users and get, let them feel our own excitement. And then you can ask them things like, did you enjoy this experience? And AMP can be used for that and they can leave feedback and that kind of thing. So again, it, I think the thing that gets me excited is AMP provides a lot more opportunity for uh, reduced friction for relationship. That's, you know, that's sort of the main play for me. I love the idea of like just telling people straight up and then also asking them about their experience afterwards. I think that's, that's key. And people will tell you, they'll be honest. Um, when I see this too, like I think of there's a future, I don't know how many years away it is, maybe not that many, uh, where the expectation will be rever the reverse of what it is now. That people will expect that what they see here is like, live, relevant, super personalized, as opposed to stale. And right. we're just not quite at that tipping point, but I do think that'll come. I think that's like coming next, right? Okay, let's get let's get into this cool example here. Uh, I love crosswords. Everybody knows me, knows I love a crossword. Stripo did this amazing campaign around uh, Easter last year, where if you like solved this Easter hunt, uh, found all the Easter eggs and put in an answer, they would give you a discount code. Um, they had a similar one with a, with a crossword which I love. I don't know why I was doing a crossword in an email. Um, so these are, I mean, gimmicks, like not in the bad sense. I mean that in like, you know, it's kind of a gimmick. It's like a real life Easter egg, but like not a, not hidden like an Easter egg. I think there's a note here about like investing in fancy games and AMP. Um, do you think this is actually worth doing for any reason other than just it's cool and it's fun? <laughs> Isn't that enough? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, yeah, right. Um, I think, you know, people need to decide on something like this based on, you know, um, what is their audience, right? Does your audience respond well to, you know, things like this and feeling a lot of fun? There's, um, so we are sort of uh, friends with uh, some of the group that does, they're called Uplers. Um, and they, you know, uh, code out, uh, emails and, and they send 
some really fun, you know, uh, animated, you know, games uh, in email, I, they're pushing the limits of what's possible. So if, if your audience uh, will respond to that, if that could earn you, you know, cred, I think go for it and have something fun. My, my vision on all of this stuff is uh, something that I learned, you know, from reading about design and, and reading from Dieter Roms is do less better. That's a quote from him. And it's this perspective of figure out what the essential thing is and then do that extremely well. And so, you know, can, can games like this, you know, be effective in email? Um, I don't know. Like, uh, is this something that can be done, you know, in a, a simple way and without, you know, too much stretch from the team? Um, one of the things I would think about is like, if you're going to do um, an, a game like this, Maybe not just do it one-off, but you're creating the environment where you can easily replicate the essential nature of the game many times for different holidays or different experiences or those kinds of things. Like for instance, on, on the left, you know, being able to like fill out like a crossword. What if that was like a weekly thing that you started having where it's just like a weekly crossword and you could submit it? Um, that could be really interesting. Like New York times crossword is pretty famous. What if they started putting theirs in an email? That could be crazy. That could be legit and really interesting. Right. So, and people could submit them and like, there could be some fun and engagement with that, or you could submit it and then it would start showing up on the web. Um, these are the kinds of things where you use strategy to figure out what's important to your audience and see if you have a mechanic that works. I love that, like building out an actual strategy around this that isn't just making it a one-off. Um, right. One of the things that, that I'll call out, and like we notice this because when we receive these AMP emails, of course, we're all super into AMP. At, at the dispatch team, we started like forwarding them around. At least my compulsion is to like forward it. And then of course, when you forward it, um, AMP emails only render for the person to whom they were addressed. They're like super personalized. And so I had to remember to like screenshot the thing, which I did to the, um, the crossword here, or I think my colleague did and like, include that and be like, look, this was the AMP email. But there, there are questions of like accessibility with this too, because this is a game that, you know, anybody with low vision or reduced vision will not be able to play as easily. Um, it requires you to have fit into the criteria that AMP currently requires, which is like, you need to be in a browser that supports it, you know? Um, and so I think that being really thoughtful about all the people who can't see this, like, what do you put in a subject line? It's like, try our game. And then like, only your Gmail recipients can really see it right now. Um, now for most people, like your list is probably 80 plus percent Gmail, but I think there's like that, that balance that we have to be careful to that not everybody can actually interact with these the way that we wanted. Um, we'll talk about fallbacks in a bit. I just wanted to throw that out there that this is amazing, but there, there are downsides too. We have to be a little bit careful, I think. Okay, here's a cool example. You kind of alluded to this. This is back to back to booking. Uh, I love this since like, instead of just unsubscribing with one click, mm -hmm. help people downgrade a little bit. Um, managing preference in an email, to me, this is such a game changer because like in terms of impact to your business, in terms of ROI, this is huge. Uh, what other examples do you think you would use this for? You mentioned, d did you notice this was an app? Like, did you like it? But like, <laughs> how else do you think you could impact your business with something like this? Just a little form at the bottom of an email. Yeah. So thing one that I thought about was, was this is a little business waiting to happen, a little SaaS product, you know, include uh, an AMP um, unsubscribe interaction in, in all, any of your emails. Um, you know, that's, yeah, that's a little SaaS product waiting to happen. I want 1% of whoever builds that. <laughs> <laughs> for, You're not going to build it? You know. <laughs> no, fuck no. <laughs> I, really good emails. We are uh, five people and we are bootstrapping this thing and it's still part-time and I don't know how we do it. So I've, I, that's enough. Um, good for you. That's impressive. Thanks. I'm ha we're having fun and we the community is incredible. It helps a lot. Um, so what I think about in this experience though is when you ask questions and you give feedback, that's essentially relational. And, oh, that's neat, Matthew, you talking about relationship, how cool, okay, who gives a shit? Like, I need to move my numbers. Yeah, like, this, that's what I'm talking about. If you dynamically create these interactions, here's what's happening in the brain. 
you're actually creating a, a synaptical connection between you know somebody taking that action and them getting a response. So when they feel connected with being listened to or being heard, or they know what that action is going to do, and you can see that change, that's a, a positive connection that builds loyalty, that builds um, you know the, the connection between the brand and the consumer. Um, and they have their problem solved. So a good experience would be um, imagine, you know, having an, like if there are emails where you have an ad mm -hmm. as a part of the email experience and you're saying, Hey, uh, was this ad, uh, any comments about the ad? Yes. Was it irrelevant? Have you already bought this? You know, blah, blah, blah. Like those kinds of interactions or imagine um, product where you can say, like a Netflix, um, you know, email. Yes. I love this. Add this to my, my queue, add this to my list. I never want to see any horror movie ever again. I hate horror. I don't know what people get out of horror. I, I do. And I don't want any of it. <laughs> and so like, I want to be able to be say in an email, like, don't show me this movie. And then it says, do you want to see any horror movies? And I can say a big fat no, right? Like, so there's two interactions there. That kind of experience is really valuable. Imagine online grocery shopping, which I've been involved in a, in a lot in the, in the, in my history and being able to say, um, I don't want to see any more products like these by like these. Do you mean organic meats or do you mean meat meat, please? Boom. Right, like that kind of interaction where I feel listened to, and then the re and then the response is not just okay, we got that, but is okay, we've removed meat from uh, your product uh, shopping experience. If you'd ever like to edit your personalization, click here, you know, and you could maybe even edit that in the email. But at the very least, you've you've shown people, you've created that interaction and engagement. I tend to think email will. Um, continue to be a place of quick, fast experience utility. So instead of big, deep interactions, it's about taking those short little um, experiences that instead of making them feel uh, protracted through taking people to the web, they get done here. That feels exciting. Yeah, I think that's that you're on something there that it will never replace, as you mentioned earlier, like the app or the browser. But um, I can imagine little things that have a big impact, like, um, you know, Songcake sending you concert notifications, um, at least pre-COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't want to hear from certain artists or you don't want to see a show ever again, like taking that action to remove it, which then removes it when you actually go to browse concerts from Songcake. Like I never want to see music from certain people ever again. Like you just quickly remove it. Ditto with any kind of music related context, being able to quickly say like, there are artists or genres that I don't like. I'm never going to like them, I right. think is valuable. I also think of it from the concept of like non-customers. Like, um, you know, I don't ride horses. I'm not interested in ever riding a horse. Like for fun, I don't need to see horseback riding stuff like clothing or people who don't have kids don't need to see diaper ads, you know, or kids clothing ads. And even right now, I think on a lot of social platforms, it's hard to opt out of targeting like that because they target you based on the very l small amount of demographic information they have. Sometimes they get it right, but sometimes they don't. When they don't, it's hard to tell them not to. But an yep. email makes it really quick to say like, don't ever recommend products like this to me. And then the next time they'll send you products that you do want. So I think the user is actually incentivized to like give that feedback because next time in this email thing that I opted into, I wanted emails from you. You'll send me stuff that I want to see, right. which ultimately makes email really valuable, more valuable than it is now. Okay. Here's a cool example uh, that I think we all, we all want to need this. Um, here, how about you just show available doodle option options without me having to like, leave the actual you know demo request or demo offer email um imagine one day being able to use like google calendar with doodle or calendly you know that like find a time feature directly in an email that's what i see right. here perfect um, small level experience yeah and like so impactful you know like um if you could increase your demos by like just 10 percent as a SaaS business like imagine the the impact your bottom line there right like uh huge and one of the risks that I see is like, is it maybe too easy to book a meeting that like people don't end up not showing up because they don't have that intent there? Like 
do we want to have some friction because it's a show of intent or is that just like some mean dark pattern like making people do more work to prove that they actually want to book a meeting like do you see any risks or downfalls with having these like one or two click things in an email as opposed to this like really long drawn out form you know i don't i i think the the thing that we're kind of honing in on here and and maybe i'm sort of developing my opinion as i talk about this but is you know this is a perfect small uh, task oriented experience that is just, you know, it's under 10 clicks kind of a thing and I can get it done. Um, and, and I'm, I'm out, right. Um, really good emails has been working on, uh, a feature where we want to, uh, make commenting on feedback on annotation on emails, uh, exceedingly, you know, expedient, easy, uh, just get it done, sort of a loom for email experience. And the ability to, to add your comment, you know, to another comment and be done with it and not have to go to the web and not have to do any of that other stuff. That's perfect. You know, that's why Gmail, you know, like a comment is a micro, micro app, right? It's just, I want to leave my comment action done. Like I'm out. You know, uh, can you imagine if every time we got an email, we wanted to reply to it, we would have to go to the web. I know that sounds absurd, but like, that's the extrapolation, right? Like it, people would hate that, you know? I mean, LinkedIn and, sometimes makes you do that and people do hate it. People always yeah. like, listen, LinkedIn, like nobody wants this. Um, there's right. no reason to, it's just because they want you to come back to LinkedIn and a few people's profiles. And hit but, those numbers, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not about you. It's about them at that point. Mm -hmm. Which is narcissistic. Right. This is like, as I've learned a lot about relationship, I quit drinking like four and a half years ago and I had to do a ton of personal work and understand, you know, my nature, understand relationship, do it a lot of mindfulness training, um, practice, I really should say. And, you know, everything changed for me and I began to understand relational dynamics and, you know, as I did, it really occurred to me how often marketing is very narcissistic here's about us. Here's this thing. We're not listening. We want to ask you questions, but only so you do what we want you to do. That's called manipulation. You know, like that dynamic is really gross. We know that intuitively relationally, but we do it, you know, with our customers. And so these kinds of things I think are a lot more fluid. They're a lot more relational. They're a lot more dynamic. They help people achieve what they want and what they need to do. So I think this is a perfect example. I love it. I want more of it. Yeah, I mean, I think marketers are, are brilliant because they're so creative and they love experimentation. And so we have nothing bad to say about marketers. I just don't happen to be one. Um, <laughs> huge respect there. But I think marketers are going to have the best ideas about how to like save people for time, reduce friction because mm -hmm. it's good for the funnel. It's good for uh, conversions, but it's also good for the user. Yeah. All right. Let's quickly talk about fallbacks because I think this kind of for me, this informs how you build an AMP email and how you kind of adopt AMP as part of your strategy. So um, we've taken the stance at Dispatch that like you should have a fallback for every AMP block or like all your AMP content and that it should be mandatory. Um, Stripo took the like go faster approach where they don't force you. And I think that's fine too. I love what Stripo is doing with email. Like honestly, I think it's or with, um, with AMP emails, it's amazing. We looked at them, I shared a couple of examples here, but our stance was that like you should have a fallback. And the reasons for that is that um, there are lots of scenarios where you will see the fallback. Um, for example, uh, you'll only be able to open the AMP content or the AMP email for 30 days after that, you see the fallback. So even if it's addressed to you, it expires. Um, there are email providers that don't support AMP. Um, people open emails on all sorts of device and provider combinations. And if you have a long tail of users who aren't on Gmail, like you do want to offer something amazing for them too. Um, and then forwarded emails, as I talked about earlier, they don't show AMP, only the fallback. And so sometimes I see these emails from services experimenting with AMP where it's like, you don't have dynamic email enabled in your Gmail settings. So you don't see this. And I'm like, actually I do, but this was forwarded to me. Like, it just feels a little snarky that they're admonishing me when really like it was at their fallback didn't know what the context was and assumed that it was that I don't have AMP enabled. Um, okay, so my question for you is, do you think we should be starting with the fallback and then building the AMP version on top, like that third layer? Or do you think we start with the AMP experience that we want and work our way back down to 
the HTML fallback is like the second priority. Um, where do we start with our intent when we're building out like a new email? I have a strong distaste for politicians, but I'm going to act like one here for a minute and just say it depends. <laughs> um, so it depends on your audience, right? It depends on uh, what they're looking for and how many of your audience uh, are, you know, people who can receive AMP emails and engage with AMP emails, et cetera. Um, but no matter what, your fallback um, like nothing vital, nothing um, essential should be left out of your fallback, right? So think of AMP as an enhancement um, rather than uh, vital information. It's a little bit similar to something like when we talk about images and using text. So if you have to put text in images uh, because you, for any number of reasons, um, then just provide, you know, ample supportive, you know, alternative text that really does its job rather than just picture, you know, or something like that. Um, the other thing to focus on here and the idea and the concept of do less better is, you know, I really like the idea of making your fallback your 100%, not your 50%. And if your fallback is your 100%, let AMP be your 120% or whatever that enhancement is. So, you know, look for the win that you can get out of it. And again, you don't have to go big like Pinterest or, you know, booking.com, just a small example uh, of being able to take some small interaction or some small answer to a question or something like that. See if that does well. And then you'll be able to like ask your, you know, supervisor or the people that you work with, I'd like to try an AMP experiment. It's going to take two days of coding and design. Then if it is successful, we can talk about what we want to do then. But if you organize it well and get your strategy right, you could have a successful campaign and you get a double down and do a little bit more the next time. So think about it like an enhancement and think about it small first. And I think you can build a real case for, for doing more and more. Yeah, I mean, a small change has the other added benefit, and that's that it's way easier to test. And right now, the testing options for AMP, um, there aren't a million ways to test this really granularly, like Litmus um, device previews, which we love. We bundle and dispatch. I use them all the time. They don't have a dedicated way to test the AMP version of an email right now. They claim that they'll show you the AMP version when you're testing, but I haven't been able to make that work for whatever reason. And so you kind of have to rely on like AMP Playground and your own rendering um, which we haven't dispatched, but really if you invest in a small change, it's easier to make sure that it works. And then it's easier to make sure that it works well, like in the fallback and in the AMP version, and then it renders in just plain text the way you kind of like are envisioning it. So yeah. I think keeping it simple is a really good way to get started. So we're coming up to uh, just a few more minutes here, but I have a couple more things that I wanted to touch on with you for the audience here. So here's an, a, an example of an A-B test with AMP that Stripo ran. And I want to talk about this one because it's like big enough that it um, speaks volumes and the results are pretty astonishing, but I don't think the results are like unique to this particular test of Stripo. So testing form conversion rates, uh, Stripo did a test with 23,000 recipients. They split it, um, not quite 50-50, but like pretty close. AMP the AMP version of the email was 5.2 times more likely to get uh, recipients to like submit a questionnaire as opposed to having to open up the browser and submit the form the old way. Um, if you had to guess the experiment, the results of this experiment, like what would your hypothesis have been? Like, do you think this folks at Stripo were like, okay, we're expecting 5.2 times more form submissions go like, wh what do you think it would have been? Honestly, I would have said maybe like 10% better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, 10% for an A-B test is pretty good. I know. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just really uh, wild. Yeah. I'm blown away. Yeah. I couldn't believe it either. And yet I do believe it because have, of how much more likely like I personally, I'm only on one data point, but um, Google Forms changes the game completely. Mm hmm Okay, a couple quick lists of more possibilities um, that we didn't talk about, but that I would love to experiment with. And maybe we'll do a follow up with this where we talk about these, but like band and cart. We haven't even talked about that. So much to do here. Mm -hmm. uh, product recommendations based on previous purchases, um, suggestions 
of what to buy with like loyalty points based on how many loyalty points you have. Um, I love the idea of everything around referrals because you can use that in a B2B context. You can use that yep. in a B2C context, referring friends. Um, and then we touched on like requesting a demo a little bit, but like register for a webinar. That's right. Very Any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Completing a survey we talked about. Um, are you more excited having talked about this by uh, transactional or marketing use cases? What do you think, what do you want to see more of like in the next few emails that you get for AMP? Like for you as a consumer, which one is going to make the biggest difference for you? Honestly, uh, I, I, have more fun in the transactional space. Like that tends to be the place where my heart beats uh, faster. Um, I love e-commerce. I love the way it works. I love intelligent e-commerce. I love feeling that feeling when I know my problem is being solved. Well, I love product for that reason. So for instance, um, I, I would rather loom show me the ability to comment on you know, I would want to watch a video in the email and then I want to be able to comment on it on a time frame right there, just get it done. Um, uh, or like pop an emoji in there, you know, like as something fast to, to engage that way. Or I want to very quickly be able to initiate, like find an Amazon product that came in and find my orders and initiate a return. Boom. Like that kind of thing is what I get the most excited about because it's deeper down the relational funnel. Mm -hmm. um, I work with people who are really excited about and very good at the beginning of the funnel. That's just not me. Yeah. For, for me, like I think you're right. I think it's easy to test those things too. I think customers are going to be happy to see this too. Instead of maybe on the marketing side, people might be like more surprised first, unless you tell them that it's an amp thing and be like, what is this new thing in my email versus transactional it just seems really fluid. Mm -hmm. I think the future though, is that all emails are going to have this. It's just going to, it's going to redefine what's really going to happen with email yep. in the next few years. I don't know how many years, but that's my thesis here. Uh, okay. A couple or three key takeaways. If we can impart the the audience with anything, I think like experimentation is key and we really wanted to convey that and I hope that's come across, but like experimentation, as Matthew suggested, like try a small thing. I think that's the easiest way to start with experimentation with AMP. Um, a key takeaway for me for sure is that AMP does set you apart and like saturated customer inboxes. Customers are telling us, you know, the recipient store survey told us they still get way too many emails. Even though it's really, e it's like easier than ever to manage your email volume and how you sort everything um we still get a lot of emails don't we and i guess the, the the biggest takeaway is that while it's early days for amp email i think the roi is proven um the results we're seeing so far are huge and the opportunity is there so i'm going to circle back to a question i started with uh with matthew and that's like would you say that this is the golden age of email and with amp where are we with regards to what you see as the golden age of email? I think that's like yeah. a nice way to summarize everything we've talked about. So, I mean, you can see how excited I get about this. I, I think when we have a dynamic, fluid interaction opportunity that honors what email is, a, a faster, uh, more utility-oriented experience, when we, we honor the characteristics of the platform that way, um, and we begin letting people have these engaging, you know, quick interactions when we have an ecosystem where people could build products that do that quickly for, you know, SaaS products that you can inject into your emails. Like I was, uh, talking about with the, uh, the footer and the unsubscribe, when you have all of that working, uh, email the return on investment just continues to skyrocket. It's already high if you do things well. And, you know, really good emails is always trying to teach everybody to create better email um, so that that ROI can be high. But if you do that well, it, it can be up at that 42% sort of, you know, golden metric that we've all heard. But if you, um, if you have the opportunity to take it even further with these things, with the numbers that you're reporting, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. The thing that, that stands in the way is that domino to fall with some of these legacy clients. And when that changes, everything really opens up and we begin to have 
developers who have not been willing to touch anything in email because it's been so complex and so tough and, and difficult to move, right? Like the people who love to move fluidly don't work in email because it's so challenging. It's the mm -hmm. constraints. It's the web of 15, 20 years ago. And so once we have that fluidity and that movement, everything will open up and we will really see, you know, email explode. And it, right now email is incredibly complex and we'll watch that complexity be reduced to something a little bit more like web flow where people are being able to create really powerful little websites, incredibly easy. The no code movement will move into email as well. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, that, that's ultimately is why I'm here. I'm, I'm, I definitely agree with everything you said and like resounding, resounding agreement there. Uh, let's take a couple of questions if we have any. I'm going to ask awesome. the audience if there are any questions. Um, I'll switch the question slide. Here we go. Um, feel free to ask us any questions about even like I could, you know, gratuitously humble brag about what Dispatch is doing with regards to AMP and doing that like the no code way, which is what we're trying to do, the um, starter contents that anybody can build. AMP emails without having to like write all the AMP code. But I think there could be really cool questions about use cases, uh, questions for Matthew about uh, RGE and how the conference went, which we could have gone, but <laughs> I'm a Canadian, I can't make it to the US right now. Um, any questions at all? I'm writing down everybody's names here so I can reach out to them and ask them why they're not asking questions. Okay. <laughs> so the first question, um, I'm going to pull, I'm not going to say who it's from. It's okay. It's a clarification that AMP is an open source project. It is. Um, it's an open source project. I'll maybe tackle this one and then Matthew, you can follow on if you like. Um, it's an open source project, but unlike other open source projects, say before you can actually use AMP, you do have to get approved to send AMP emails. You have to be an approved sender, um, which requires jumping through like a couple of little hoops. Uh, but then once your domain is a registered, is registered with Google, you can send uh, AMP emails. So it's, yes, the clarification is that it is an open mm -hmm. source project. I, I would just say that it's not an open source environment, right? Like that's the distinction that I would make is that maybe the ultimately the tech is there um, but until we have something as, as fluid as HTML, I think we're, we're lacking. We're, we're not, we're not there yet. Okay. And then we have another question here about, uh, our thoughts about Outlook dropping AMP. Uh, the question says thoughts about Outlook dropping AMP. I know this was discussed recently in email geeks. It was, and, um, they actually put out, uh, an update on like the Outlook playground, um, I can't remember if there was a press release as well. Um, I'll give my view on this. I don't think they're dropping support. I think they're just dropping a lot of the resources they had to like make AMP really accessible and really easy to test with Outlook. My view is that they'll come back around. It's just too early. Maybe they invested a bit early and they'll come back around. Um, is it cause for concern? Kind of depends on your list, like how many folks uh, are using Outlook. Um, but I guess, does it like temper my excitement? Personally, I would say not. Matthew, what about you? No, um, I think it's just a matter of time. I think it's important to put pressure on these kinds of things, um, you know, so that, you know, it, depending on your audience, you, you need to make a decision about whether to use these pieces of technology. But uh, we, we need to keep pushing against it so that we can see movement. Um, what's proved out here will get other people excited about what's possible uh, in other stacks, not just Google, right? So. That's what I get excited about. Right. Okay, move on. Uh, we have two or three more here. How do you feel about having only one CTA in the email you send? How can you convince your clients to remove a lot of CTAs? I think it's more like a broader email question, not really sure. Clear, but I'll hand that one to you. I think that's a good. Yeah. So uh, what I would suggest is uh, running a simple split test, right? Um, see what your audience, you know, connects with and see if you can get better engagement when there is uh, less decision fatigue. Now that said, um, sometimes like I like to think, oh yeah, 
focus people, focus people, <laughs> but it doesn't always work. Some, some types of audiences seem to love a lot of shit in their emails. So you just, you never quite know you want to work with the people you have in front of you. And then the simplest way to do that is just to create uh, the same content. Uh, don't change the subject line. Don't change the preheader. Keep everything as simple and straightforward as you can, but just change uh, the number of CTAs to maybe like one at the top and one at the bottom or something like that and see if you can increase the effectiveness of that single CTA. Yeah, I think that's like spot on advice. I have nothing to add to that. That's that's exactly it. Okay, uh, next one here is, don't you need ESP support to send AMP emails? Any major ones announced support since the launch? Yes, you do. Not all ESPs support AMP. Um, one of the things we think about is like we use, uh, you know, uh, marketing automation platforms, I should say, to like send stuff out. And they, a lot of them don't support AMP. So um, the list of ESPs that are really accessible, if you're like doing stuff at scales, like Braze, they support AMP. A um, bunch of our customers who use AMP, they also use Braze to send emails. So that's like a really nice partnership. But like you can use Spark Post as well. There's a really long list. And the most up-to-date list isn't in my head. It's on like the Google website. So amp.dev, they'll give you the whole up-to-date list of who supports that. Um, Cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep going here. How much complexity and time do you think AMP email increases on average compared to normal static email creation and planning? That's all you. Okay. <laughs> uh, it depends what approach you take and how much um, familiarity you have with this. Uh, I don't code AMP email myself, as I've told you. Um, I would say it depends what you're starting with. So if you're starting from I guess like the first thing to say is that you're going to be building the regular version of the email anyway. So that part's like a sunk cost. You're doing it anyway. Adding the AMP layer, I think the first time you do it as you're figuring how everything out, figuring out how everything works, you know, it might take you like maybe a day, maybe less. Um, but then from there, I think it's pretty quick. And if you used a platform like Dispatch or Stripo, um, on Dispatch, you'll be able to just use pre-coded blocks. So you could have that ready in minutes, that extra AMP layer. So I'd say like talk to us about it because uh, we'll help you go faster, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so I, I would say like the the hardest part is probably the creative and making that work with HTML. I'm going to shamelessly plug dispatch here. I mean, the way we've, <laughs> we've approached AMP is like, it's so awesome. I'm so excited. So definitely recommend trying it out or contacting us about that. Okay. Next question is all Matthew and that's, will unspam 2021 be digi digital? I echo this question. <laughs> Uh, almost undoubtedly. <laughs> what a weird world we're in. Uh, I love that uh, you all care about unspam. That makes me super happy. Um, we, uh, we're talking about it. We've got a, um, a lot going on at really good emails, but you'll hear from us, you know, before too long. Um, but we will always want to support a, a safe environment. So um, the thing that matters to us is, is really connecting the community and helping people feel good. I think we can still do that online. So we'll figure out some ways. We'll let you know. Thanks for Karen. It's good to hear. All right. And then the last question um, is kind of a nice one to end on. And that's, do we maintain a list of companies that are using AMP in amazing ways? Uh, we mentioned Stripo, Pinterest, Uplers, Booking.com. Any other examples or companies to subscribe to? So I would say let's differentiate between companies that are sending AMP emails. So like mm -hmm. Uplers, Stripo, Dispatch, where email production platforms or email production agencies. We don't, we are going to use AMP emails in our own stuff, but the, the cool examples to look at that include Pinterest and booking, um, those are like not email production services. They're actually like the, the B2C or some cases B2B examples. Uh, we keep a list. There's some really good lists out there on the internet if you like search around, but um, a couple of things that I've been excited to see are like Indeed is using AMP for job recommendations. Mm. So that you only see live job posting. So if the job posting closes by the time you open the email, you don't see it in your email. I think that's like a really cool use case. Um, other example, oh, I mean, the Google use cases are the coolest because they're using them for like submit a form, for applying to a comment, um, for the add to cart examples, which I think are like really, really cool. Um, Matthew, can you think of a couple more? I'm sure I'm spacing out on like my favorite ones right now. Um, I think you've really touched on all of them. The, the way that I am getting my examples is, is usually looking around on Pinterest to see who's pinning things 
Um, but then, you know, the, the AMP website is just fantastic about showcasing, you know, best in class stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll, I always love hitting up the email geeks Slack channel. I think that's a fantastic place for anybody who's operating an email. If you're not already a part of that community, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, me too. Definitely. I'll touch on quickly a couple things and then we'll wrap up. And that's, um, some questions about like being approved as an AMP sender and like spam stuff. Um, I actually can't speak to how complicated it is to get approved as a Google sender because while we did the application, the part that happens on the Google side is like very much kind of a black box right now. Um, mm. I would say that there wasn't a ton of back and forth for us. We felt that it was pretty straightforward. And there's a lot of people talking about this on like the email geek Slack. Like there's a lot of help around for that kind of thing. And um, any impacts regarding spam deliverability, not that I've seen or heard. Um, I think because Google does kind of like they apply quite a lot of scrutiny to your application. They probably make sure that you're not sending a whole bunch of junk. So uh, it's probably safe. Um, I want to wrap up here and say a huge thank you to Matthew Smith. I've enjoyed the conversations and I hope that the audience has. It seems like it's been useful for a few folks. Awesome. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And I hope that everybody's just as excited about trying out AMP as we are. Yeah. Wonderful to speak uh, with you, Veronica, and and it's just been fun to get, dig into this topic. I love this stuff. So, if you anybody has any questions about email in general, just hit me up at, at whale on Twitter or really good email, um, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Veronica.